Lesson 11 The Seal of God and Mark of the Beast, Part 1 Sabbath Afternoon, June 3 Satan is constantly presenting inducements to God's chosen people to attract their minds from the solemn work of preparation for the scenes just in the future. He is in every sense of the word a deceiver, a skillful charmer. He clothes his plans and snares with coverings of light borrowed from heaven. He tempted Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit by making her believe that she would be greatly advantaged thereby. Satan has many finely woven, dangerous nets which are made to appear innocent, but with which he is skillfully preparing to infatuate God's people. There are an endless variety of enterprises constantly arising, calculated to lead the people of God to love the world and the things that are in the world. Through this union with the world, faith becomes weakened. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 550. If we indeed have our citizenship above and a title to an immortal inheritance, an eternal substance, we have that faith which works by love and purifies the soul. We are members of the heavenly family, children of the heavenly king, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. At his coming, we shall have the crown of life that fadeth not away. The privileges granted to the children of God are without limit. To be connected with Jesus Christ, who, throughout the universe of heaven and worlds that have not fallen, is adored by every heart, and his praises sung by every tongue. To be children of God, to bear his name, to become a member of the royal family, to be ranged under the banner of Prince Emmanuel, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Sons and Daughters of God, page 372. It is not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciples of Christ to follow him. They behold the Savior's matchless love, revealed throughout his pilgrimage on earth, from the manger of Bethlehem to Calvary's cross, and the sight of him attracts, it softens and subdues the soul. Love awakens in the heart of the beholders. They hear his voice, and they follow him. As the shepherd goes before his sheep, himself first encountering the perils of the way, so does Jesus with his people. When he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. The way to heaven is consecrated by the Savior's footprints. The path may be steep and rugged, but Jesus has traveled that way. His feet have pressed down the cruel thorns to make the pathway easier for us. Every burden that we are called to bear, he himself has borne. The soul that has given himself to Christ is more precious in his sight than the whole world. The Savior would have passed through the agony of Calvary that one might be saved in his kingdom. He will never abandon one for whom he has died. Unless his followers choose to leave him, he will hold them fast. The Desire of Ages, page 480. Sunday June 4. Steadfast Endurance There are two great principles, one of loyalty, the other of disloyalty. We all need greater Christian courage that we may uplift the standard on which is inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The line of demarcation between the obedient and the disobedient must be plain and distinct we must have a firm determination to do the Lord's will at all times and in all places. Christian strength is obtained by serving the Lord faithfully. Young men and young women should realize that to be one with Christ is the highest honor to which they can attain. By the strictest fidelity they should strive for moral independence, and this independence they should maintain against every influence that may try to turn them from righteous principles. My Life Today, page 73 If your present faith is yielded so easily, it is because you never sent down the taproot in clinging faith. It has cost you too little. 
If it does not sustain you in trial and comfort you in affliction, it is because your faith has not been made strong by effort and pure by sacrifice. Those who are willing to suffer for Christ will experience more joy in suffering than in the fact that Christ has suffered for them, thus showing that he loved them. Those who win heaven will put forth their noblest efforts and will labor with all long-suffering that they may reap the fruit of toil. There is a hand that will open wide the gates of paradise to those that have stood the test of temptation and kept a good conscience by giving up the world, its honors, its applause, for the love of Christ, thus confessing him before men and waiting with all patience for him to confess them before his Father and holy angels. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 166. This is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. The work of conquering evil is to be done through faith. Those who go into the battlefield will find that they must put on the whole armor of God. The shield of faith will be their defense and will enable them to be more than conquerors. Nothing else will avail but this, faith in the Lord of hosts and obedience to his orders. Vast armies furnished with every other facility will avail nothing in the last great conflict. Without faith, an angel host could not help. Living faith alone will make them invincible and enable them to stand in the evil day, steadfast, unmovable, holding the beginning of their confidence firm unto the end. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 182. Monday, June 5. The Cosmic Struggle Many people seem to be ignorant of what constitutes faith. Many complain of darkness and discouragements. I asked, are your faces turned toward Jesus? Are you beholding him, the Son of Righteousness? You need plainly to define to the churches the matter of faith and entire dependence upon the righteousness of Christ. There has been so little dwelling upon Christ, his matchless love, his great sacrifice made in our behalf, that Satan has nearly eclipsed the views we should have and must have of Jesus Christ. We must trust less in human beings for spiritual help and more, far more, in approaching Jesus Christ as our Redeemer. We may dwell with a determined purpose on the heavenly attributes of Jesus Christ. We may talk of his love. We may tell and sing of his mercies. We may make him our own personal Savior. Then we are one with Christ. We love that which Christ loved. We hate sin, that which Christ hated. These things must be talked of, dwelt upon. Reflecting Christ, page 82. The third angel's message is the proclamation of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. The commandments of God have been proclaimed but the faith of Jesus Christ has not been proclaimed by Seventh-day Adventists as of equal importance, the law and the gospel going hand in hand. I cannot find language to express this subject in its fullness. The faith of Jesus, it is talked of, but not understood. What constitutes the faith of Jesus that belongs to the third angel's message? Jesus becoming our sin-bearer that he might become our sin-pardoning Savior. He was treated as we deserve to be treated. He came to our world and took our sins that we might take his righteousness. And faith in the ability of Christ to save us amply and fully and entirely is the faith of Jesus. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 172. When the time of trouble comes, every case is decided. There is no longer probation, no longer mercy for the impenitent. The seal of the living God is upon his people. This small remnant, unable to defend themselves in the deadly conflict with the powers of earth that are marshaled by the dragon host, make God their defense. The decree has been passed by the highest earthly authority that they shall worship the beast and receive his mark under pain of persecution and death. May God help his people now, for what can they then do in such a fearful conflict without his assistance? Courage, fortitude, faith, 
and implicit trust in God's power to save do not come in a moment. These heavenly graces are acquired by the experience of years. By a life of holy endeavor and firm adherence to the right, the children of God were sealing their destiny. Beset with temptations without number, they knew they must resist firmly or be conquered. They felt that they had a great work to do, and at any hour they might be called to lay off their armor, and should they come to the close of life with their work undone, it would be an eternal loss. They eagerly accepted the light from heaven, as did the first disciples from the lips of Jesus. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 212 and 213. Tuesday, June 6. The Ungodly Chain Christ warned his disciples in regard to what they would meet in their work as evangelists. He knew what their sufferings would be, what trials and hardships they would be called upon to bear. He would not hide from them the knowledge of what they would have to encounter, lest trouble, coming unexpectedly, should shake their faith. I have told you before it come to pass, he said, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. John chapter 14, verse 29. Their faith was to be strengthened rather than weakened by the coming of trial. They would say to one another, He told us that this would come, and what we must do to meet it. Behold, Christ said, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 and 22. They hated Christ without a cause. Is it any marvel that they hate those who bear his sign, who do his service? Testimonies for the Church, volume 9, page 235. The worshipers of God will be especially distinguished by their regard for the fourth commandment, since this is the sign of his creative power and the witness to his claim upon man's reverence and homage. The wicked will be distinguished by their efforts to tear down the Creator's memorial to exalt the institution of Rome. In the issue of the contest, all Christendom will be divided into two great classes, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, and those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. Although church and state will unite their power to compel all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, Revelation chapter 13, verse 16, to receive the mark of the beast, yet the people of God will not receive it. Fearful tests and trials await the people of God. The spirit of war is stirring the nations from one end of the earth to the other. But in the midst of the time of trouble that is coming, a time of trouble such as has not been since there was a nation, God's chosen people will stand unmoved. Satan and his angels cannot destroy them, for angels that excel in strength will protect them. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 55 Every moment of our life is intensely real. Life is no play. It is charged with awful importance, fraught with eternal responsibilities. When we look upon life from this point of view, we realize our need of divine help. The conviction will be forced upon us that a life without Christ will be a life of utter failure. But if Jesus abides with us, we shall live for a purpose. We shall then realize that without the power of God's grace and spirit, we cannot reach the high standard he has placed before us. That I may know him, page 85. Wednesday, June 7. Those who follow the Lamb. In Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 to 10, is described another beast, like unto a leopard, to which the dragon gave his power and his seat, and great authority. This symbol, as most Protestants have believed, represents the papacy, which succeeded to the power and seat and authority once held by the ancient Roman Empire. Of the leopard-like beast it is declared, 
there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. This prophecy, which is nearly identical with the description of the little horn of Daniel chapter 7, unquestionably points to the papacy. The Great Controversy, page 439. The Lord has a people on the earth who follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. He has his thousands who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Such will stand with him on Mount Zion. But they must stand on this earth, girded with the whole armor, ready to engage in the work of saving those who are ready to perish. We need not wait till we are translated to follow Christ. God's people may do this here below. We shall follow the Lamb of God in the courts above only if we follow Him here. We are not to follow Christ fitfully or capriciously, only when it is for our advantage. We must choose to follow Him. In daily life we must follow His example as a flock trustfully follows its shepherd. We are to follow Him by suffering for His sake saying at every step, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job chapter 13, verse 15. In Heavenly Places, page 298. Multitudes in the world are witnessing this game of life, the Christian warfare. And this is not all. The monarch of the universe and the myriads of heavenly angels are spectators of this race. They are anxiously watching to see who will be successful overcomers and win the crown of glory that fadeth not away. With intense interest, God and heavenly angels mark the self-denial, the self-sacrifice, and the agonizing efforts of those who engage to run the Christian race. The reward given to every man will be in accordance with the persevering energy and faithful earnestness with which he performs his part in the great contest. In the games referred to, but one was sure of the prize. In the Christian race, says the apostle, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. We are not to be disappointed at the end of the race. To all those who fully comply with the conditions in God's word, the race is not uncertain. They all may gain the prize and win and wear the crown of immortal glory that fadeth not away. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, pages 34 and 35. Thursday, June 8. Jesus our only mediator. The Lord of heaven permits the world to choose whom they will have as ruler. Let all read carefully the 13th chapter of Revelation, for it concerns every human agent, great and small. Every human being must take sides either for the true and living God who has given to the world the memorial of creation in the seventh day Sabbath, or for a false Sabbath instituted by men who have exalted themselves above all that is called God or that is worshipped, who have taken upon themselves the attributes of Satan in oppressing the loyal and true who keep the commandments of God. This persecuting power will compel the worship of the beast by insisting on the observance of the Sabbath he has instituted. Thus he blasphemes God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 424. The person who is drawn again and again by his Redeemer and who slights the warnings given, yields not to his convictions to repent, and heeds not when he is exhorted to seek pardon and grace, is in a perilous position. Jesus is drawing him. The Spirit is exerting his power upon him, urging him to surrender his will to the will of God. And when this invitation is unheeded, the spirit is grieved away. The sinner chooses to remain in sin and impenitence, although he has evidence to encourage his faith, and more evidence would do no good. There is another drawing to which he is responding, and that is the drawing of Satan. He yields obedience to the powers of darkness. 
This course is fatal and leaves the soul in obstinate impenitence. This is the blasphemy that is most general among men, and it works in a most subtle way until the sinner feels no remorse of conscience, no repentance, and consequently has no pardon. That I May Know Him, page 244. The accession of the Roman Church to power marked the beginning of the Dark Ages. As her power increased, the darkness deepened. Faith was transferred from Christ, the true foundation, to the Pope of Rome. Instead of trusting in the Son of God for forgiveness of sins and for eternal salvation, the people looked to the Pope and to the priests and prelates to whom he delegated authority. They were taught that the Pope was their mediator and that none could approach God except through him, and further, that he stood in the place of God to them and was therefore to be implicitly obeyed. A deviation from his requirements was sufficient cause for the severest punishment to be visited upon the bodies and souls of the offenders. Thus the minds of the people were turned away from God to fallible, erring, and cruel men, nay, more to the prince of darkness himself, who exercised his power through them. Sin was disguised in a garb of sanctity. When the scriptures are suppressed and man comes to regard himself as supreme, we need look only for fraud, deception, and debasing iniquity. With the elevation of human laws and traditions was manifest the corruption that ever results from setting aside the law of God. The Story of Redemption, pages 331 and 332. For further reading, The Upward Look, God's Word is True, page 352, and In Heavenly Places, The Voice of Duty, page 226.